Open our Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. Father, we come to you, Lord. We do pray, God, that you would speak to our hearts. God, as we look at this uh, message, Lord, of uh, just uh, ultimate corruption in mankind, God, and Lord, uh, just how we see that a catastrophe is going to follow this corruption, God, in the form of a flood, God, as we hit Genesis chapter 6, God. Pray that you open the word to our hearts, that you speak to us, Lord, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Angela and I visited the Creation Museum in Kentucky uh, last year, and in the museum they had a theme called The Seven Seas of History. This morning, pop up the title again, if you wouldn't mind doing that. This morning, we're going to go from what is called corruption, which starts with a C, to catastrophe, which starts with a C. And we started the Bible with creation, which started with a what? A C. So I'm going to go through a little um, uh, summary of what's called the history of the Bible. See, this is the seven C's creation cube. All the classrooms have one of these in the classrooms. And through it, you can teach the major historical events in which is important to the Bible's message. And we saw that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. So the first C of the seven C's in the historical um, events is creation. And we know in day one, if you pop up the next slide, we have kind of a summary. We see in day one that God created matter. He actually went ahead, he created the earth, he surrounded the earth by, with water, and then God spoke into existence and said, let there be light. And so immediately we now have light and we have energy, we have matter and we have energy. And then in speaking, he said, he's going to separate the darkness from the light, right? The darkness he called what? Day, night, and the light he called day. That was the first day, right? And that was now time. So God created matter, he created energy, and he created time all within the first day. The second day, we do realize, as you see day two, he separates the waters from below and the waters from above, and he created space. It's called a firmament, or called an expanse. And at that time, he created space, outer space, he created the atmosphere and the sky at the end of day two. At day three, he went ahead and he caused all the water to gather together and he created dry land in one mass. We'll talk about that as we go through six, seven, and eight. And then at the end, he went ahead and filled it with all plants and trees at the end of day three. Now we have oxygen going up into the atmosphere. Day four, he went out and he created the sun, the moon, the stars, the planetary systems in which you can guide yourself and navigate yourself. It talks about the months and the seasons and the years. Day five, as you know, we created the sea creatures of the water and the flying creatures of the air. Day six, we created what? The animals, including the dinosaurs at that time. But he also made the most great creation. After he created the animals, he created humanity in the image of him, right? Man, male and female. He did all of the most incredible creation, all in the first sea there in chapter one and in the chapter two of creation. After he finished it, had a marriage, he called it all very good. Very good. There was no corruption. There was no sin. There was no death. There was no disease. It was a perfect environment that God created. And then in day seven, he rested from his creative work. We know that God continues to hold all things together, so he still works. But he rested from his created work. Adam and Eve were created with the ability to live forever in this incredible paradise, fellowshipping with God. And God gave him what? One rule. One rule. Eat of any tree, any fruit, anything you want of the garden, except of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of what? Good and evil. One rule. Shouldn't be too hard. You're fellowshipping with God. You don't have a sin nature. One rule. But at the day that you eat it, you will surely what? Die. Exactly. Both physically and spiritually. And so, unfortunately... What did Eve do? She took of the tree and she ate of the fruit, right? She gave some to her husband who knew better. 
He did a willful disobedience. He ate of the fruit. And you know what happened? What happened was the second sea. And that second sea of corruption. So chapter 3 then goes into the second sea. So we go from creation to what? Corruption. Talked about the corruption that now entered into the world. And so it's sad because devil being the real uh, uh, being that he is, entered into the form of a serpent, deceived them both, and they ate of the tree. And they began to die at that point. And since that point, all the descendants of Adam are now born with a sin nature. Our bodies will all physically die. Last week, for those of you that were here, we went through chapter 5, right? And we said, and they died, and they died, and they died, and they died, except for Enoch, right? He went directly to be with the Lord. But the rest died, and they died, and they died. And that's what's going to happen. But see, the good news is God didn't abandon man in this corruption. Genesis 3.15 actually gave them a promise. They said, from the seed of a woman, one's going to come that's going to crush the head of who? The serpent, Satan. And that was a messianic promise that from Genesis 3.15, in the midst of this corruption, in the midst of all the, the curse upon the ground and the cursed world that they're going to be lived in, the corrupt world that they're going to be lived in, the Messiah is going to come. The Christ is going to come. And we know him as who? Jesus, who would save us from our sins actually all the way through. Well, all the way through, and we're going to continue in the chapter 6, is talking about the corruption. Following the corruption, we're going to see there's going to be a huge what? Catastrophe. A huge catastrophe. A worldwide flood of a global flood so catastrophic that all of mankind and all of animal kind, land animals and birds that did not enter into the ark were what? Killed. They were destroyed all the way. So let's go open up. Because people say, was it really that bad that God would kill everything? Let's go read you know, in chapter 1, excuse me, verse 1 of chapter 6. Now before I read this four verses, I'm going to just share, there's a lot of controversy about what these four verses mean. And I'm Explain what they are about so you get an idea, and I'll share what my perspective is about it. And if you want to disagree, that's fine. There's great, great theologians that have different perspectives on this and very respectable theologians. So let's read through this passage. Verse 1. Now it came to pass that when men began to multiply on the face of earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful. And they, that's the sons of God, took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord, seeing all this, he says, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his days shall be 120 years. Verse 4, there were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and there bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were old, men of renown. Please look back at verse 1. It says, during those days, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth. We have a huge rapid expansion in the population prior to the flood here. But there was another problem in the midst of this population. Interesting. There was an ungodly marriage between the sons of God and the daughters of men. So I'm going to try to make that somewhat uh, easy to understand. This is not an easy to understand concept. But the Bible is saying that the sons of God saw who? The daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took them for wives for themselves, whom they chose. Does that make sense? We'll talk about who the sons of men are, and excuse me, the sons of God and the daughters of men. And then it says that the result was there were some giants. The Hebrew word actually is Nephilims in the Hebrew. It says, and there were giants 
or Nephilim on the earth in those days and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and bore them children, they were mighty men of old and men of renown. So the next slide will kind of show you. So the, the belief is, and most people have this belief, that because of this ungodly marriage, there were some unnatural children being born called Neph Nephilims or giants. Now, you look at the situation, and if so, the question would be, what's, who are these sons of God, and who are these daughters of women? There's three viewpoints, four different viewpoints. I'm going to look at three of them. One's called the Sethite viewpoints, and if you pop up the next slide. So I still have the same setup, daughters of men, sons of men. The Sethite perspective is this. There was a godly line and an ungodly line. The godly line was following through Adam, through his son, who? Seth. Some people say the sons of God were actually the men of Seth. They actually had ungodly marriages and relationships with the daughter of men, and they, the people that hold this view believe that the daughter of men were the daughter of Cain, which we know to be very what? Ungodly and evil. And the result was they had unnatural children. But, but the problem with that perspective, at least from my perspective, is just because there's ungodly relationships, would that be enough for God to wipe out everyone? Hear what I'm saying? It's a perspective. And just because you still have a human here and a human here, would that cause Nephilims to be produced genetically? So my, my thought right now isn't in this perspective, but I want to share it. It's called the Sethite perspective. I have a different viewpoint, and here's the reason why. Three times in the Bible, the sons of God are referred to in Job. Job 6 says this, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. So here it talks about the sons of God being an angelic being, possibly fallen angelic beings. Job 2.1 says, and again there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came along with them to present himself before the Lord. Again, these are angelic beings, not people. Job 38.7 says, when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. So these aren't fallen sons of God. These are angelic beings. <clears throat> the only three times the word sons of God are used, they're referring to what? Angels. Possibly fallen angels, possibly not fallen yet, but they're referred to as angelic beings. So it, <clears throat> if you have a Septuagint, which is a, a Greek translation of the Hebrew, they actually translated the sons of God as angels. So there is a thought that these are, sons of God are not descendants from Seth, but rather what? Angelic beings. So now you have what's called the fallen angel perspective. And so if you pop up the slide, is this. When the sons of God, and people believe these were fallen angels, demonic angels, those that left their first estate, we'll talk about this, married and saw the daughters of men, which are human women, they then had unnatural children, Nephilim giants. The question has to do is, how could that possibly be? I mean, is the, the sperm of the, of the, do they even have sperm? Is that even possible? They took the form of a, of a human. We know angels can take the form of a man, right? We've seen that. Can they actually have sexual relationship with women? There's another view that goes called the, uh, I call it the fallen angels possessed men. In other words, we know that demons can possess people. And so this is the fallen angels possessing that the fallen angels possess men. They now have a relationship with human women and produce Nephilim. I'm not too sure if that's going to change again the, uh, the, the DNA within the sperm of these normal men because they're possessed. Confusing, isn't it? 
It is confusing. I'm not saying it's not confusing. That's why this is a very highly confusing debate. Trying to make it simple. The three perspectives. Right now, and I'm open to change, I hold the second perspective. That these were actually angelic beings who took the form of, of men and have sexual relations with women. And you might say, well, Brad, why do you think that? Because I ask my question, Brad, why do I think that? Why do I hold this perspective? And let me share with you why I do. Jude 6 actually tells us of angels who did not keep their proper domain, but they actually left their habitation. Let me read to you Jude 6. Jude 1, 6, there's only one. The angels who did not keep their proper domain, that's their first estate, but they left their abode. They left their place where God had them and the estate that God had them, the position that God had them. It says, these angels, these fallen angels, God has reserved in everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So this is speaking of very specific angel demons who somehow left their holy place, their condition with God in heaven, in the presence of God in Jesus Christ, and their appearance. And God now has given them a specific judgment because they did this. But 6 continues into 7, talking about these angelic angels. As Sodom and Gomorrah and then the cities around them, in similar manner to these, gave themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, has set as an example suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. In other words, these angels, possibly the reason they're going to get this special judgment is because they also entered into immoral, unnatural, strange flesh, sexual relationships. Therefore, the result is God's going to have them uh, in this special judgment. 1 Peter 3, 19, 18, 19, 20 tells us when Jesus actually goes to these disobedient spirits in prison after he died and rose from the dead. It says in 1 Peter 3, 18, For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the spirit. Got it? By whom also, now this is talking about Jesus, he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Now read this who formerly, these are fallen angels, right? Who formerly were disobedient. When were they disobedient? When once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of what? Noah. In the days of Noah. Well, the ark was being prepared. In other words, during the time when, when, when the ark is being prepared, it's 120 years that the ark is being prepared, that these, this is great that I can't hear. It is, it is, it is great that these angelic beings were actually uh, on the earth. So from these, I, I believe that the reference of these fallen angels are actually disobedient demons who did not keep their first estate, their proper domain, Married has sexual relationship, producing unnatural children, Nephilim and giants. Polluting the gene pool. Now we got a problem. The gene pool is now being polluted. Yeah, Brad, but didn't Jesus say that angels neither marry nor are given to marriage? See, I always ask all myself these questions. I mean, when Jesus was, was correcting uh, the Pharisees about the resurrection, because they said that people actually, there's marriage in the afterlife, in heaven, Jesus corrected them. And he said to them in Matthew twenty two thirty, For the resurrection, that's they, people, neither marry or are given a marriage, but are like angels in, of God in heaven. In other words, angels of God in heaven don't what? Marry and are given to what? marriage. Those are God's where? Are those angels where? In heaven. But if those angels in heaven left their first estate and went down unto earth now, we have a whole different situation. Jesus never said the angels were sexless. Woo! Just food for thought. Just food for thought. Because I'm not too sure how else to reconcile that those complicated verses. 
Now, that's about as complicated a verse as you're going to get in God's Word, just so you know this morning. I tried to make it somewhat easy. There is a, a book, it's not inspired scripture, but it might have some accurate information, called One Enoch. And it actually says, And it came to pass that the children of men were multiplied, that in those days were born to them beautiful and comely daughters. And the angels, the children of heaven, saw and lusted after them and said to one another, Come, let us choose wives from among the children of men and beget children. They, that's these angels, then took for themselves wives. These chose for himself one, and they began to go in on them and defile them with them, themselves with them. And they taught them charms and enchantments, and they became pregnant, and they bare great giants. And there arose such godlessness and they committed fornication, and they were led astray and became corrupt in their ways. Now, this is not the inspired word of God. This is one Enoch, but it may have uh, some aspects, account that it does align with a perspective. But what I do want you to understand is that the, these Nephilim were somehow uh, uh, maybe half human, maybe half uh, fallen angels. And if that is true... That might be one of the reasons why we have a lot of mythologies that go back to some aspect of gods and what? Coming onto women and Greek mythology could be formed. Roman mythology came out of Greek mythology. And an aspect, a lot of, a lot of mythologies, there's one aspect of truth to it, but the rest gets blown out of line. Just food for thought is what I'd like to say. But why would Satan want to pollute the human gene pool? Because Satan knows that from the seed of woman, what? One's going to come that's going to crush the head of him to destroy his work. If he can mess up the gene pool, then he can stop the Messiah from coming through the line. Wouldn't put anything past him. That's what I think. In the midst of those four verses... There's verse 3. And verse 3 says this. The Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with men forever, for he is indeed flesh. Yet his day shall be 120 years. Some people ask the question, if you have a New Living Translation, and I, 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 my, I normally read through, when I read through the Bible, I use it out of the, out of the New Living Translation. But... If you read this out of the New Living Translation, I think that they, uh, didn't, they did more of a commentary because this is what it says, and pop it up in the question box. In the New Living Translation of my Bible, it says that verse 3 says, in the future, the normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. Does that mean that the normal lifespan of a man would be 120 years? Has anybody ever heard that coming from this passage? I've heard different people say, well, doesn't it say that the lifespan of man is no more than 120 years? If you have an uh, NLT, that's what it says. In the future, their normal lifespan will be no more than 120 years. I, I, I look at that like anything else. And I, I don't believe that I think this translation has nothing to do with the lifespan of man. I don't think it's talking about that at all. In fact, when we talk about the lifespan of man, Moses wrote in Psalm 90.10, this is Moses, he was 120 years old when he died, but he wrote, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they're what? 80 years. I mean, Moses is saying the normal lifespan of a man is going to be 70 to 80 years, which is somewhat what we have, what, T today. So I don't think when it says there that it's been given his days shall be 120 years. So if we look back at Genesis 6-3 again, and I have a little timer by that. Pop that up. So it actually says that the lifespan of of a man is going to says it says yet his days shall be 120 years. So does that mean the lifespan of a man shall be 120 years? My answer is no. What it means is there are 120 years until what? Judgment. 120 years until the worldwide flood comes. In the midst of talking about this corruption of mankind and these Nephilim and giants, God says that my spirit will not always strive with man. There's 120 years left, and then judgment. 
That's what's going to be happening. Because now we're going to continue this, and we're going to continue all the way down through verse 13, and you're going to see the corruption of mankind that continues. A time is coming, 120 years, and it's a time for you to repent because judgment is coming on the face of this world as a cataclysmic, a catastrophic event. So I'm going to read verses 5 all the way to verse 13. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, Wow. And that, check this out, every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. <laughs> We're evil, got it. We're only evil, got it. Let's throw an adverb on there. We're only evil, how much? Continually. I, like, I can't make a more powerful verse. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping things and the birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And this is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And the earth was also corrupt before God. And the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the earth. This leads us to a question and pop up the question, because the question some people ask is, was it really necessary to kill all those innocent people in a worldwide flood? How could God kill everyone? I mean, everyone, annihilate everyone. Well, I want to make sure you, you don't miss the passage that we just read again, because I'm going to ask you after reading this, how many innocent people are there? Look at verse 5 again. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart were evil continually. The earth was corrupt, verse 11, before God, and the earth was filled with violence, verse 12. So God looked upon the earth, indeed it was corrupt, and all flesh, all flesh, everyone had corrupted their way before the on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the flood. There weren't any innocent people. We live in a world that's pretty morally decrepit now. And look how he described the days of Noah at that time. That was pretty, pretty bad. I'll pop up a slide here with some different aspects of it. God's word states, number one, there was unnatural relationships occurring between the sons of God, angelic beings, I believe, and human women producing unnatural children, Nephilim, giants, polluting the gene pool. We then saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth. We saw that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually, only evil continually. There's no break. The earth was corrupt before God. The earth was filled with violence. All flesh corrupted their way on the earth. That's in my synopsis. There is no aspect of man's nature that was not corrupted by sin. Every aspect of the human heart was corrupted. Thus, we get the whole aspect before that corruption is corrupted. Got it? That's the second C. And God said, because of that, I'm going to send the third C, which is what? Catastrophe. First C was what? Creation. Second C was what? Corruption. Third C is what? Catastrophe. And the seven C's of the history of biblical importance here. We saw in verse set, 6, it says that the Lord was sorry that he made man, that he grieved in his heart. I want you to understand that God is... I'm sure when God did what he did, he, he, he felt so much pain. He, he was grieving. 
He, he created man to live with him, for, for, for men to turn to him. But no one is turning to God. No one is coming to him. They no longer love the Lord. They abandon God. They want nothing to do with God at all. They want to live in their own sin. And that hurt him. It grieved him. You know, if someone rejects you, someone that you love so much, someone that you pour into your heart, it grieves you. It hurts you, doesn't it? Someone you care about rejects you. And so that's exactly what happens. Now, God sees his plan. He knows what was going to happen. He knows, you know what I mean, the Messiah is going to come. He knows the beginning from the end, but it still what? Affects him. It still causes grief. God says in 120 years, judgment is coming. Genesis 6, 17, looking a little bit ahead, says, And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is a breath of life, everything that is on the earth. God's telling this to Noah. He's going to give Noah the plans to build the ark. And we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to get in depth into the ark and how it was built and structured and length and height and rooms and decks, how he could have fed all those animals, how they got on board, what animals they were, what kinds they were. We're going to really hit it next week. And I'm sure that Noah got this message and he had to be heartbroken too. His friends, people that he knew, are all going to die because of their sinful ways. For 120 years before the flood, he's working on this ark. He's getting food for the ark. He's getting everything planned and water and figuring this all out. He built the ark. But as he built the ark, every nail he put down was a nail of faith that I believe God on his word. How would you like to do that? Never having a flood, never probably having rain ever occurring, and you're building a boat bigger than the size of a football field. And you're building this thing, and you got it all propped up. How are you going to launch it? I'm not. I'm not going to launch it. I'm going to get in it, and it's going to just float and move. And we'll talk about how it's able to do that and stay afloat and stay up that doesn't upright. Very ingenious. But as he's doing this, by faith, he believed God was going to do this. See, faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. By faith, he knew God's word was going to come about or he would not have built the what? Ark. Faith without works is dead. It's dead. His actions showed his faith. And as he did that, I'm sure he's getting ridiculed. We'll talk about him next week also, the righteousness of him. He bore a witness that, the, that the, the judgment is coming and you better turn from your sins. In fact, I think his actions were accompanied by words also. We read in Hebrews 7, the hall of faith. We've read that about <clears throat> Abel. We've read that about Enoch. And now we read about Noah. By faith, Noah, being divinely warmed of things not yet seen, seen that's what faith is, right? Moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household by which he condemned the world. Now that he is little he, not big he. So who is the one who's speaking condemnation out? Noah. He's sharing with these people. Condemnation is coming. Turn from your sins. It says in 2 Peter, Peter 2.5, <clears throat> if God did not spare the ancient world, but saved Noah, one of the eight people, a preacher, or a herald of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. He was a herald. He's sharing the goodness of God for 120 years. Not only is his life saying judgment is coming, I believe it, judgment is coming, my actions align with my belief system. He's telling people, I pray that you repent and you turn from your sins and your actions align with your belief system. And that's the point of Peter is making to, to know at this time. We live in a time where the days that we live in today are very similar to the days of Noah. And I want you to check on to this verse. <clears throat> Luke 17, 26 says, As it was in what? The days of who? 
Noah. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. They ate, they drank, they married wives, they were given to marriage. Everything was going wonderful until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. See, we know the Lord's going to be coming soon. We know when he comes upon this earth to rule and reign, it's going to rain for a thousand years, and it's going to be ugly for those people who haven't received him. And as we look at what's happening back then, an exploding, pop, exploding population we saw, right? Sexual perversion, demonic activity, every intent of the thoughts of man's heart were only evil continually. Is that where we are today? Is that where we are today? That people don't want to hear about the goodness of God. They don't want to hear about the love of God. All they want to do is just ridicule those people who believe in God. Ridicule those people. I'm, I'm sure Noah got his, his head full of ridicule and joke and teasing during that time. But I want to, you know, as, as, we, look at this, as we look at this whole aspect of, of uh, Noah and what's happening, we know that a catastrophe is coming. God's going to once again destroy this world, not by a flood, but by fire. And those of who have trusted in him, who has received him, will not go through that judgment. We're going to have communion this morning. And uh, as we do, I just want you to just return. I mean, understand that Noah escaped judgment by entering the ark. There was only one way to enter the ark. It was through the door. All that entered that ark were what? Saved. Did Jesus say, I am the door? All who entered in by me will also be what? Saved from the judgment of sin, from the consequences of sin? Have you asked Jesus Christ to be your Lord and Savior? Have you said, God, I want to follow you. I want you to be my Lord. I recognize that you died on the cross for my sins, that, that you were my substitute, that you took the wrath that should have come to me, and I give you my life. If you haven't, I want to give you a chance to do that before we have communion. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time to just come and to commune, Father, and just uh, remember what you've done in communion, Father, as we partake of the juice and partake of the bread. But if there's anyone here who's never said, Lord Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. I release and give you my life. I want to follow you. If this is you, you haven't done this, lift up your hand. Is there anyone here this morning? Anyone here? If you're watching online, say, Lord Jesus, come into my heart to be my Lord and Savior. Enter it through the door of Jesus. Before we continue, also, if there's anyone here who might be having a difficult time or want some special prayers in their life, some struggles they might be going through, maybe you're some selfishness or some anger or some gossip or some jealousy, or maybe you have some burdens of guilt or unforgiveness or you want some other special prayer for health or something you want as a body, to pray for. I want you to pray for me, for my healing of my ear. Is there anyone else that wants some prayer? Look up so I know. Thank you, sister. Thank you there. Thank you back there. Thank you there. Thank you in the very back. Thank you. Thank you, brothers. Thank you in the middle. Thank you. Thank you for looking up. Let's pray. Father, we pray for each other, God. We pray for healing, but both physically, we pray for spiritual healing, Lord. We yield you our lives, God. We don't want anything to stop right now as we come in and commune. Forgive us of our sins. Give us a fresh cleansing through the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, can I have uh, Derek?